Intelligence is per se its accessory. Intelligence just tells you what's the situation and what's the likely course of action. In principle, there is no specific uh, path to follow. What you should bring with you is expertise. Expertise in one essential of the essential fields of knowledge, useful knowledge, that means regional uh, studies, or of course all the MINT studies, all the technical uh, and IT studies. But the most important thing is that you have a solid knowledge and awareness of substance. Then, in a second uh, layer, you either in, engage in intelligent studies, in term, but that's the second step. The first step is, and this is what I really try to bring forward, is you need to be competent in one major issue. And this is your asset, which you bring with you into the intelligence world. Because intelligence is about knowledge, and if you don't uh, know, yeah, anything, yeah, then it's uh, really hard. Uh, methods alone do not help. That means studying, learning, bringing it with you, uh, and then get an additional education or a tradecraft training in the services or at the master studies, for example, for intelligence security, which is offered by the Federal University in Berlin. As so often sheer accident, so my, my studies uh, focused on, uh, or let's say, Orientalism, Islamic studies. I intended to become a historian, maybe even a professor. So in the end, at the very end of my uh, career, I became a professor. But in between, there were some, uh, several different uh, steps. Uh, I, in addition to my studies, I practiced as a reserve officer at the Ministry of Defense. Uh, then in Bonn, uh, uh, working on situation awareness, defense and military situation awareness in the Middle East, because uh, folks said, well, if you are a soldier and you are uh, expert in the region, why not join us? From there, I was recruited. At my time, this was late 80s, it was not possible to apply. If you had applied to BND, uh, they would have rejected you from the very beginning, suspecting that you would possibly be an agent provocateur uh, of uh, you know, the other side. Nowadays, uh, you are two clicks away from uh, applying. In one sense, definitely, in helping uh, to understand a given situation, the interests, uh, the ambitions of an adversary, sometimes even of you know, doubtful allies. So it uh, helps you, as a decision maker, to navigate in choppy waters. Yeah? Uh, in addition, look at what is uh, uh, happening in Ukraine. Intelligence superiority, information superiority, it's hard to say, but it is the truth. If you know where your adversary is located, you can kill him. Which is happening, as you know, day after day in Ukraine, due when based on, uh, let's say, the intelligence and information superiority provided, to all likelihood, by the United States of America. So it's targeting, it's target acquisition, and then just shooting and hitting the target. So, you know, it helps yeah, uh, to defend yourself, to stop aggression. It does not help to end a war. Here you need knowledge about the intentions and then, of course, a proper a diplomatic political uh, effort. Uh, the BND, to put it uh, in a f kind of bottom line, since the Federal Republic of Germany is a major power, so uh, it is a crucial power uh, and hence the service supporting decision making in Germany is crucial by definition. That does not mean uh, that the service is uh, so drilled in, in each and every aspect. That would be an exaggeration. Uh, there are strengths uh, in technical uh, in based intelligence, that means SIGINT, COMINT, uh, as far as law allows. In terms of tradecraft, much more would be possible, but uh, there are very severe restrictions which sometimes uh, hamper the capability of the service to cooperate with other services. That's a weakness, but it's a political and legislative weakness. Uh, the service maintains worldwide global uh, links to other services, which sometimes are very helpful in you know, preparing the ground 
uh, and sharing uh, expertise uh, for supporting then uh, German or joint European or NATO-based uh, politics. So in that regard, I would not say uh, it's a crucial service, but it's an important one, really important. Um, why does uh, BND does, uh, does not figure uh, with a high profile in public uh, uh, consciousness? Well, that's a decision of government. Uh, services, secret services normally are secret and uh, should be secret. Uh, this does not prevent, as you see in UK and in the USA, for example, that governments uh, take pride in presenting the services or refer to services as source of their situation awareness. That could well be the same in Germany, but this uh, is, you, you will have to ask the government why they are shy in doing so, obviously. Well, this was, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, these had been the mediation or facilitation missions between Israel and its enemies, uh, Hezbollah and later on Hamas. Uh, my mission uh, concerning Hezbollah was, of course, a high-profile political diplomatic mission on behalf of uh, UN uh, SG's Kofi Annan and Ban Ki-moon. And, of course, I was not accustomed to that. Yeah? This is, of course, uh, yeah, being propelled on one hand in the middle of global attention. On the other hand, you are forced still to remain secret. Uh, it doesn't go well together. I tried hard and fortunately I succeeded in that. This was the main. The other one is, of course, uh, that uh, your negotiation is always embedded in political, uh, uh, in a political framework you do not master. So Israel has its interests, Hezbollah has its interests in the back of Hezbollah, Iran has its interests. We should not forget that Hezbollah is strongly influenced, of course, by Iran. So how to navigate? Even if you find a compromise, you don't know whether this compromise falls through or not, and where. Yeah? On the Israeli side, possible, or on the Hezbollah slash Iranian side. And even worse, uh, the situation was uh, between Israel and Hamas, because uh, first of all, look, they, they are fighting wars not day and night, but continuously. It's lots of acrimony, it's lots of hostility much more vivid than uh, between Hezbollah and Israel. It's calmed down, yeah? it's an established enmity. The other one is uh, a vivid enmity. And so negotiations sometimes are part of warfare. Yeah? And, uh, and combined with the will to inflict maximum damage to the counterpart. And you as a mediator are, let's say, uh, between the both fronts. Yeah? So this is a very... Uh, Risky, politically speaking, risky situation. I survived, as you see. Uh, rarely, very rarely, and not really existentially. I had some critical moments prior to my time in the BND when I uh, tended to be in the wrong time at the wrong place. Uh, but uh, during my time, uh, BND's security is pretty tight. So I did not show up with my name for a very long time. So I had cover names. Uh, so, and if you're Mr. Meyer or Mr. Muller, uh, you find some difficulties in find me and uh, my family as well. Uh, and partners who knew were very diligent. That's true not only, for example, for Israel, but as well for Hezbollah, as well for Hamas. They all, for their own self-interest, but as well uh, in terms of uh, hospitality and fairness, uh, kept my uh, whereabouts and whatabouts uh, nearly completely secret. So I had no substantial reason to fear. It's a problem. It's a problem. Uh, since uh, your data, your personal data as a civil being, a normal being, with a bank, with insurance companies and so on and so forth, including uh, biometric uh, reconnaissance uh, capabilities, if you combine these data, uh, which is not that easy, by the way, but if you are able to do so, you can easily pinpoint, look what Bellingcat, for, for example, is, uh, has been doing and what uh, Bellingcat can do, services can do as well. Yeah. So that's a challenge, that's an oper in a challenge of operational security, as we call it. Yeah. Uh, there are means to avoid it or minimize it, uh, which of course uh, will have to be kept secret, uh, but uh, it's, sometimes it's uh, a challenging situation. Very true.
intelligence services again, first of all, uh, clarify the situation on the ground. Where is the target? How to approach the target? How you could damage the target? Yeah? This is the kind of military intelligence uh, you collect if you have the bad intention to uh, inflict that damage on the target. So targeting and exploring the target. Uh, and apart from that, uh, intelligence uh, shows to you as well where your adversary in the battlefield is. Yeah? So uh, it supports, it supports uh, their respective sides. I mean, the Russians are doing the same, uh, or trying to do the same. Um, the um, Americans, the Ukrainian services, the intelligence services are doing it f uh, mainly with signal intelligence, uh, that's uh, communication intelligence, with imagery intelligence, that means uh, satellite-based uh, images, and as well measurement uh, intelligence, that means collecting um, electronic or uh, physical emissions from the ground, yeah, which you can, if you have the sensors, which is very, very advanced technology, yeah, uh, then you can identify targets even if you don't see them. Yeah, you identify them via their technical footprint. Identify and locate them. And then you can, of course, uh, uh, target them. Yeah, that's the role of uh, intelligence services, apart from possibly then on the political side, trying to understand the intentions of uh, your adversary or other actors on the ground. So first of all, uh, sometimes we, we don't know whether all the damage done is a result of a precise targeting or, let's say, a precise you know, um, performance of the weapons involved. Yeah, you can target, but uh, you can miss your target. Yeah? If uh, you know the steering components and navigation components of cruise missiles, for example, uh, do have mistakes, or you in you have a wrong you have wrong uh, data, yeah? uh, and you program yeah, your missile, uh, and then it's just one kilometer or 500 meter to the left or to the right, yeah, and then you are hitting playgrounds or whatsoever. So uh, we know that uh, Russian technology sometimes is a little bit flimsy. Yeah. Also the Americans yeah, with their super technology, yeah? uh, if you look at their drone war, drones war, yeah, uh, very often uh, hit the wrong target. There it's mostly the problem, not the technology, but the wrong targeting. You misidentified the target and then you hit something or someone, even worse, uh, thinking it was him and it was unfortunately a kindergarten or whatever, or a family. Yeah? So uh, both sides. Yeah? Uh, have their, their flaws and their problems with that. So having said that, what seems to be clear is that at least uh, substantial parts of uh, critical infrastructure uh, should have been hit and destroyed and damaged. Most of the damage done, as far as we know now as uh, outsiders, yeah, we don't have the full picture, but what we see is that the majority of targets hit and destroyed seem to be critical infrastructure. So switching off the lights, cutting water supply, yeah, making life miserable yeah, uh, in very many cities. This is quite clearly pre-planned. You can't do that uh, within uh, 24 hours or 48 hours. So the reaction, uh, this kind of reaction uh, to the terrorist act concerning the poor, the poor Kerch Bridge yeah, uh, is of course, well, it's window dressing. Yeah, so you have this is a kind of pre-planned targeting and you have it as a kind of contingency in your toolbox. Yeah, and then you just used it. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, it seems to be a kind of political internal reaction uh, since uh, the Russian decision makers and especially Mr. Putin had been strongly reproached from his own supporters yeah, you know, you don't need enemies if you have such friends. Uh, and uh, so he had to show uh, strength and determination. So it's 50% at least domestic politics. And the other one is the message, the strong message to Ukrainian decision makers and their supporters. Listen, uh, it's not over. Even if we lose on the ground here and there, yeah, we have our means which you can't sufficiently prevent and limit to hit you uh, quite severely. The one is not directly connected to the other. That means you can still win on the battleground from the Ukrainian side, 
uh, it depends now how strong you can develop your resilience at home. Because the longer this damage uh, can be inflicted today, there were uh, additional hits by missiles. I don't think that many we will see. Yeah? When, uh, when and if this kind of uh, campaign endures, then of course uh, you end up with uh, insufficient infrastructure in supporting your war effort. It's not yet the case, but it could happen. Yeah, that supply, for example, yeah? supply routes, supply capabilities, storages, and so on, could be destroyed. And then uh, Ukrainian troops might suffer the same problem uh, their uh, Russian colleagues have on the other side, lack of logistics. It's a sensitive issue, as you know, nobody talks uh, voluntarily about that. Uh, so. First of all, I don't know exactly how it is, but if we look at the public available data or picture, um, American capabilities supported Ukraine from the very beginning. Uh, and here we have the classical military uh, reconnaissance work. Yeah? So that's quite clear, uh, showing where the troops are, where the targets are. Yeah, where the intentions are. Uh, reportedly, I'm careful, reportedly the Americans also advised uh, the Ukrainians of the, you know, this kind of initial special operation because, I mean, the Russians did not want a war. They really did not want a war. They wanted a special military operation. That means paying a, a kind visit to Kiev, decapitating the government, possibly literally, uh, just removing the government, having a pliable one, and then occupying the country. The, the troops were not there to fight their way, yeah, but just to move in. And here and there, possibly where there is local resistance, just have a heavy-handed response yeah, and say, listen, you have to obey, no? keep calm, carry on in the sense, be now, accept the, your new leadership, and uh, here we are. Yeah? Uh, that would have happened then, uh, in the wildest dreams within one, two weeks. Yeah? Everybody would have been uh, appalled, yeah? but then the Russians would have said, look, we are here, the government, all fine. Yeah? That's what you call a fait accompli. Yeah? So, as you, and this fait accompli was prevented by timely and relevant and obviously actionable intelligence to all likelihood uh, from, from the Americans. Yeah? Signal intelligence, imagery, and say, listen, they will come to pay you a visit, so better be prepared. And they were. Yeah? They were prepared, it just, you know, when they arrived, they got a warm welcome. Yeah? Uh, um, only if you have the means and the determination to do so. Yeah? So intelligence is, per se, it's accessory. Intelligence just tells you what the situation and what's the likely course of action. Yeah? But uh, deciding what to do and how to do in order to prevent it or in order to fight back or whatsoever, this is a different thing. That's operational. It has not much to do with intelligence. So intelligence is just there to support you in your decision making. Yeah? And uh, even if, for example, to remain in the example, if the Americans uh, had said to the Ukrainians, listen, they are going to pay a visit to you in Kiev, and they would have said, we don't believe it. Yeah, we don't prepare. Yeah? The best of intelligence would serve to nothing if not the relevant decisions yeah, had been made by the Ukrainians. Just We take it seriously. What could we do? How to avoid being trapped and how to fight back? Yeah? So you see, this is the operational thing. The necessary precondition for that, but uh, not the... Uh, the necessary but not the complete precondition for that is just to uh, uh, give the information in a timely way, which is important, timely and in an actionable way, so that you know, okay, that's a situation to our likelihood, that's what I have to do, and then you have to do it. And if you don't do it, intelligence fails. It's a failure uh, in being perceived uh, in the right way. Well, you know, there is a soldier saying, uh, in peacetime, administration is the enemy. <laughs> so, but you should add, don't fight the system, use it. 
That means you will have to be a, a very knowledgeable uh, civil servant or military uh, person, knowledgeable in terms of how your organization is being run. As I said, don't fight it, use it. And if you know the ways to use it, you have to invest time and energy in understanding the ways, the official ways and sometimes the semi-official ways, uh, how administration in your field works. And uh, then you need to have friends as well. Sometimes if you need an extra, uh, you won't get it in the normal way, bottom up. You only get it top down if you can convince some of your superiors that it is worth the exception. So you need to be uh, accepted, acknowledged as a professional and then they sometimes are even doing something in your favor. Uh, and never give up. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much. Here we are. <laughs>